the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Well, I grew up in the church. It, it, it has been what I have known and loved since I was a young kid. In fact, I'm told, and I, I think I remember in kindergarten, my dad was a, my, my dad's a retired pastor now, but in Gainesville, Texas, when I was in kindergarten, I'm told, and I remember, I think, my dad invited me to come up on the stage at the end of the service, and I was able to preach. Now, as I look back on that, I think... Those poor people, they probably just wanted to go to lunch. <laughs> and here I was. I remember in elementary school and, and at the church where my dad was the pastor, standing out in the parking lot and welcoming people as they drove into the parking lot, going to their car doors and opening and saying, we're going to have a great day at church today. I'm so glad you're here. I remember as a teenager, as a teenager, when I was finally able to drive, going and picking up five or six other friends of mine, piling them into this like small minivan that we had, and driving them to youth group and to Bible study, both of which I was leading and was a part of. I loved it. I loved being a part of that. I remember when I was in college, and when I wasn't traveling for the university, going to, and serving in churches, leading worship and things like that, I was working part-time at a little church in West Nashville, Tennessee. Love the church. And then in the winter in January of 2002, took my first full-time position in church just up the road here in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So much of my life in fact, almost all of my life to this point has been given to the church. And I love the church. And I know that there are a lot of things that the church has done throughout history that has not been very good. But there's been a lot of really good things that the church has done. In fact, I want to take a moment right now, and those of you who are watching online, because I know there are so many of you that are out there as well, but even if here, if you want to, take a moment, and in the comment section of our gathering today, if you want to just share, and I, I know, I don't, I, I know there's lots of things that have happened in churches, and people have been hurt by churches, but just for a moment, I want us to think about the good things that church has done in our lives. Whether it's connecting us with someone or, or the first time that we've actually began our faith. If you look on the grand scheme of thing in history, the church has been a part of like bringing hospitals to areas where there was no health care. I even think about how we're part of the, the feeding program in Guatemala. Bringing food, and in during this pandemic, bringing food to places where they were starving. So just for a moment, if you would comment about how the church, what the church has done, and I'm not just talking about this local church, you can, you can share about that, but I'm talking about what you think of when you think of what the church across the world has done. What good has it done? For a moment, share some of those ideas and thoughts that you might have. Over the years, I have seen a lot of stuff. I have seen the church at her finest and at her worst. Now, I have seen people who grew up in the faith beside me walk away after being disillusioned or discouraged or hurt. I have seen an 80-year-old man, I literally have seen an 80-year-old man who came back to faith, 
gave his life to Jesus, and I baptized him. 80 years old. I've seen it. I have seen people call themselves the church, but really they just wanted to be in a country club for their families, making it hard for anyone to get inside their circle of friends. But I have also seen people who call themselves the church who collectively determine we don't want to just talk about Jesus. We want to live like Jesus in our communities and in our world. And after all these years and all these experiences and all these encounters, even at this very moment in time, after such a changing year that we've experienced, I ask myself, what does it mean to believe in the church? What does it look like right now? What, what will it look like going forward? And hopefully, we're just, hopefully we're a third way through this pandemic and the light is at the end of the tunnel. But really, the question is, why does the church matter? And why does what we believe about the church matter? We've been talking about the Apostles' Creed, right? This, this uh, set of belief statements, these confessions of faith that early Christians made in the 8th century, a long time ago, that they've been agreed upon by churches across all kinds of denominations, Protestant and Catholic. Christians together agree upon these confessions of faith. And it provides us with boundaries within which we can explore the deep mysteries of the faith. Last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit. Pastor Joe, man, what a powerful message he brought. I believe in the Holy Spirit. How we need now more than ever to trust and lean into the Holy Spirit as our advocate the one who does the work of revealing the truth about God the Father, God the Son, and the truth about the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is because of the Holy Spirit that we can say that we believe, we believe in the church universal, the communion of saints. Now, this idea of church universal, the the original text of the creed says the Holy Catholic Church, and and basically what that means is is the church that's across the globe, a church that is, is, is made up of all types of people, right? That there is one global church without geographical boundaries made up of diverse groups of people, types of people and groups, and spans across history and into the future. That is the church universal. The, what I like to say sometimes, the church with a big C, all right? There is one global church, let's put that slide up one more time, without geographical boundaries, made up of diverse types of peoples and groups and spans across history and into the future. And the reason that there is only one church made up of diverse people and groups is because there is only one son, The global, historical, spirit-led church is referred to by the Apostle Paul as the body of Christ. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, this is in the New Testament, he says, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. There is only one church because there is only one Jesus. Well, what about all those different types of denominations? I mean, we live in Charlotte, where there's over a thousand different churches all kinds of flavors, right? Well, this is why going through the Apostles, Paul, Apostles' Creed together is so important. Because the reality is, from the very beginning, 
When you had 12 different disciples, and then you add on the next group of apostles who come, you are bound to have different experiences and different perspectives, right? You are seeing here that what this creed does is it goes back to these guide rails. It deals with the essentials. So over the long period of time of the church, when these church leaders and seeking the help of the Holy Spirit found that when all these different types of diverse peoples and groups agreed and confessed these foundational beliefs, when everyone agreed on these basic themes that are found in Scripture, they make up the church, Big C Church, right? Michael Bird, I've been reading a book that says what Christians should believe. And he writes this, he says, one of the interesting things, one of the interesting things about the early church is that they considered themselves to be a worldwide movement through a network of assemblies spread throughout Palestine, that's in the Middle East, Syria, Asia Minor, Greece, and Italy. The church is not restricted by geography, ethnicity, gender, class, or status. It is a universal assembly that is made up of people from every tribe, language, culture, and place. There is one church that exists in all places, and yet it adheres to one faith. See, we are part of something much bigger than our minds can even imagine when we embrace the church. But to embrace the church, to believe in the church and the communion of saints means to step up to the part you play in the church. That if you confess Jesus is Lord of your life, that if you believe in the Holy Spirit, then you have to see what the Holy Spirit is trying to get you to see. You can never read the words of Jesus again without seeing this pulling in your guts and in your spirit. That God has such purpose for your life. And it is found in the New Testament book of Matthew chapter 28, after Jesus is risen from the dead, after Jesus had shown himself to them, he gives them very clear instructions. It's at the end of the book of Matthew. He says this in verse 18 of 28. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. Listen to these words. This is the key. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mm. This is what it means to be the church. That every single thing we do has got to be with this goal in mind. To introduce people to Jesus. This is why we're always talking about love around here. Because we believe so strongly in the love of Jesus that we want our lives to be defined by his love. Because in verse 20, Jesus says, teach the new disciples to obey all my commands I have given. And when Jesus talks about commands, he literally starts with love, right? He literally starts with love. Back to Michael Bird, this uh, theologian, he says, the church is the visible gathering of the faithful, for the representation of Christ's presence in the world. He goes on to say, the church is not where we meet or what we do. It is who we are. Isn't that good? At least I would say that's who we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be the representation of Jesus' presence to the world. 
That phrase we use the time is all the time is not just a, a warm fuzzy phrase when we say be known for love, right? We say it a lot, but it is a challenge to us to remember who we are supposed to be. It is a reminder that we are part of something beyond our little corner of the world. See, we are the church. Everywhere we go, the church goes. Everything we say, the church says. Ooh. It can feel overwhelming at times, right? The weight of the responsibility, the feeling of inadequacy. But that's also the beauty of the church. The church, which is a, a people who believe in the Holy Spirit. So if we believe in the Holy Spirit, that also means we believe that we need help to live into our identity. We do not do this on our own. And we never should claim that we do it on our own. Jesus himself said he would be with us. Do you know how Jesus is visibly seen with us? It is through the communion of saints. See, Jesus becomes visible to the world through the lives of his people. Let that sink in for a moment. Jesus becomes visible to the world through the lives of his people. The gathering and the sharing and the encouraging and at times even lovingly speaking truth into each other's lives. See, after the church in the book of Acts is birthed, right? The, the birthplace of the church at the day of Pentecost. You know this story? Maybe you don't. But there's this moment where, where the people have gathered together and they're praying and asking Jesus to pour out his Holy Spirit like he said he would. The people set out after they experienced this encounter with God's Holy Spirit. They set out into their new reality. They begin to learn what does it actually mean to live as the church? What does it mean when our way of living is actually centered around Jesus? And in Acts in the New Testament, chapter 4, starting in verse 32, listen to what this church begins to look like. It says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned <clears throat> was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles to give to those in need and to care for others. I love this picture of the early church. So much trust, so much peace. There is so much compassion and empathy for other people and for each other. There was no condemnation over those who had versus those who didn't because they looked out for each other. And I want to tell you, I just want to pause for a moment and brag on you for a second. Those of you who are part of Pineville Church, over this past year, you have given, you have reached out to those in need you have said, if there's someone in need, let's find a way to take care of them, to help them. And we have done that, and I am so thankful for you. I'm so thankful to be a part of this, this picture of what the church is supposed to look like. That is you, Pineville Church. God has used you, even in the midst of all this turmoil, even in the midst of all the uncertainty, even in the midst of all the fear, you have risen to the occasion and said, where can God use us to help and care for not only each other, but for those in our community, for those in Guatemala? That is you. You have done that. 
You know, it's no accident that this guy Barnabas is highlighted in this story. This man must have been someone whose life overflowed with encouragement and generosity. The the apostles are encouraged by him and his name. Think about how many names are actually in the Bible, right? There are a lot of names, but not everybody's name makes it in there. Barnabas, Joseph, here we are reading about him thousands of years later. Isn't that awesome? But what is really important in this story is how attentive they are to each other. Listen, you cannot know the needs of others if you do not take the time to get to know other people. You cannot know the needs of others. And well before there was this pandemic, the struggle over being too busy to be known by others was real. Am I right? Do you remember when we would fill our schedules and our kids' schedules? When we would convince ourselves we didn't have time, when the reality was we have time for what we want to have time for? Remember that? I remember that in my own life. But we cannot live into this identity of being the church if we do not allow our lives to be shaped and formed by the presence of Jesus in each other's lives. The Jesus showing up in your life has got to impact and shape the way Jesus is showing up in my life. Do you see that? That's why we we have this emphasis on, on growing and serving and sharing and caring about the world. These values at Pineville church that is critical to the growth of our faith both spiritually and inviting others into it and we cannot grow our faith by ourselves it's why we talk about Sunday classes and small groups it's why we're starting this this new idea I don't know if you've heard about it yet I, I sent out a letter I hope you got the letter that talks about smaller groups right where we want to invite people to to be a part of these little networks of, of, of people three to five different people in a group it could be all men it could be all women it could be singles it can be couples it could be intergenerational it can be over something that you do but the point of it the purpose of it is for connection and encouraging each other in the faith it's so that we see and we experience Jesus Christ in each other's lives because it encourages us to keep moving in our faith so I want you to be a part of of a small er group. <laughs> like that? A little play on words. Small er group. The point being, we can actually be together in these types of groups and challenge each other to live what it means to be the church. When we intentionally interact like this, <laughs> We are practicing this idea of the communion of the saints. And trust me, I'm not saying that you are all a bunch of saints. Especially at some point when Steve Godfrey watches this. I'm talking to you, buddy. That's a joke. Steve is one of the finest people in the world. Because not only are we connecting to each other in this moment. I love this. We are connecting to those who have gone before us. To those who've had to meet in the the secrecy of their homes because they say Jesus is Lord. We're connecting to the apostles and the disciples and those early Christians who lived in fear but clung to the faith. We're connecting with those who have gone before us, even here in this church that's over 90 years old, those who have laid down the groundwork for making the church visibly present right here in the southwest corner of Charlotte. 
we're connecting with a bigger picture. Think about that. Think about what it's like when we get into these little groups or we get into these moments where we're encouraging each other, studying scripture, praying together, challenging each other to continue to, to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Think about all those throughout the thousands of years who have done the same thing. Isn't that awesome to think about? That is the church. That is the communion of saints. And listen, even in death, when someone goes on who has been in the faith, we believe that they become one with Jesus, right? And when they become one with Jesus, the same presence of Jesus is acting in our lives, engaged in our lives. See, the, there's also the reality that the church is different than any organization on the planet. This is what makes the church different. The point of connection, of, of striving to encourage each other and challenge each other to grow our faith. Uh, the point of investing in, in creating the, the online gatherings that we have. The point of serving our community and the point of caring about the world. The point of packing 100,000 different meals to share in Guatemala. The point of giving $150,000 to help build a community center in Guatemala. Well, you know what the point is, right? The point is simply Jesus. Again, Michael Bird says this, what the church has to offer the world is not our architecture, our programs, our press releases, our politics, our clergy, or you like this, or our potlucks, though those are really good. <laughs> won't you, that would be great to get back to those again someday, won't it? But listen, the best thing and really the only thing we have to offer is Jesus Christ. You know, all, all my years in the church, like I said, I've seen the bad and the, the ugly side of the church. I, I've seen, I've, I've been stung by it and hurt by the church at times. The church has made mistakes especially when it forgets who its Savior is. And when the church is ruled by fear instead of love, judgment instead of forgiveness. And we're going to get into the forgiveness of sins next week as that part of the Apostles' Creed. Because I want to tell you something. Don't miss it. Forgiveness is so important and finding forgiveness for your sins offered to you through Jesus is the most important experience you will ever have in your life. You hear me? And that's what we'll get into next week. But today I want us just to reflect on this idea of what it means to believe in the church the communion of saints. Would you stand with me if you're here in person? If you're online, I'm going to ask all of us just to close our eyes as we move into a time of reflection and prayer. The first thing I want to do is extend an invitation to you. If you have not, that today you would receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. To begin the journey of becoming part of a family, a community whose sole purpose is to connect us with the one who loves us so much that he created us. That is the church who wants to help us define our true identity in Jesus' love for us. That's the communion of saints. So today, if you have not, I want you to say the prayer with me. In just a few moments, we're going to pray a prayer. 
And I want you to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Ask him to forgive you of trying to do it all by yourself, to forgive you for the sins in your life that you know are destroying you. Maybe today you have prayed that prayer. Maybe today you've been walking in faith. So let me ask you this. How are you doing at representing Jesus in the world around you? Have you become too preoccupied with where or what the church is that you've forgotten to be the church where you are? Let's pray together. Father, I pray for those who might be watching or who might be here in person who sense you speaking into their lives. They want to be a part of the church. They want to be a part of something that goes beyond geographical boundaries. That carries them with a history and leads them into a future. Lord, I pray that they would accept you as their Lord and Savior, that they would ask you in this moment to forgive them of their sins and to give you their lives. Father, I pray for those of us in here who have, maybe we've been in the church for a long time and maybe we've forgotten what we're really supposed to be doing. Would you help us to represent you, your son Jesus, in the world we live, in our homes, oh God, help us, in the grocery store, in our workplaces, in our schools, in the classroom. God, may we be your representatives. May we be the church today. For it's in your name I pray.